Hey everyone, this week I've had the keys to this 2020 Toyota Supra. Uh, there's tons and tons to talk about regarding this vehicle, so in an effort to keep the scope of this video somewhat in check, uh, I'm going to focus on three main areas. First, I want to do an exterior and interior walk around. Uh, as everybody knows by now, it's built and engineered by BMW for Toyota, so uh, it's a BMW product and walking around it will really kind of help to make that point I think second I want to get behind the wheel and demonstrate the four ways to get the best noises out of this thing's uh, exhaust system because it can sound really cool and then third I just want to sit down and share some more of my thoughts on this vehicle maybe touch a little bit more on the BMW Toyota relationship and then uh, just kind of share who I think this vehicle is for and the vehicles that it more or less competes with. I think that's interesting to talk about, especially given that the sports car market has shrunk a lot since the last Supra was on sale during the 1990s. So without further ado, let's start with the walk around. All right, one point I really want to try to drive home here is that this vehicle looks a lot better in person than it does in photos. And I'm hoping I can kind of convey that in-person experience via video here. The lines all just work really well together. Uh, it's got creases, curves, bumps, swoops. It's not a bad looking car, but I can see how in photos people might feel otherwise. Sure, it's got some awkward angles. Like right here, it kind of looks like it has a big nose, but then you move over to the side And yeah, it's still got a little bit of a nose, but it doesn't look quite as big. The headlights have a little bit of Mark IV Supra in them. I do appreciate that. Uh, the proportions of this vehicle are a little bit thrown off relative to the Mark IV Supra that was sold during the 1990s. And that's because Toyota introduced the FT1 concept uh, as the design inspiration for the next generation Supra. And that was before they knew they were gonna be working with BMW on this project. And once they started working with BMW, they had to adapt that design, the FT1 design, to BMW's pre-existing platform. So the proportions were a little bit thrown off, but I think it still looks pretty good. I mean, from this angle, it's got that long nose, the distance between the A-pillar and the wheel, uh, say Supra to me. Move around to the back. You can see it's got the GR badge. I always forget that Toyota wants you to call this the GR Supra. GR stands for Gazoo Racing. That looks to be Toyota's uh, new performance brand. I guess it's not new, but it looks like the branding that they're gonna use for some of their sports cars moving forward. Around the back, you've got that F1 car inspired light. Dual exhaust, this is one way to tell a six cylinder Supra from the new four cylinder model that's introduced for 2021. The tips on the four cylinder aren't beveled like they are on the six cylinder here. But it looks pretty good from the back. They've updated the Supra logo. So it's still, it looks a lot like the Supra logo used on the Mark IV, but uh, it's been modernized a little bit. I'm glad that they still kept that aesthetic because I think it's a really fun font that they use there. You can see the roof kind of has a domed design where it cuts in uh, in between the driver and passenger seats. Yeah, really great looking car, big haunches on this thing. Even the body cladding down here looks pretty good. It works for me. Yeah, I'm not really a stickler for aesthetics. I think that most cars look fine, and uh, I think this one looks better than fine. So, I think we've covered the exterior. Let's take a look in the trunk. One thing I do really like about the Supra is that it's a hatchback. So pop the trunk here, BMW key, BMW key for a BMW car. And yeah, decent storage space there. The big hatch opening makes it easier to load and unload things. You've got two speakers there that eat into the cargo area a little bit, but something I really like is that you can reach into the cargo area from the driver's seat. So it's practical. There would be a cargo cover in here. Automakers tend to leave cargo covers out of these press vehicles, I think because reviewers probably tend to take them out, put them in their garage, and then forget to put them back in so they get lost. Uh, but you can see, bodywork, 
comes over, hatch overlaps with the bodywork a fair bit. Here's your grab handles. Here's the uh, federally mandated trunk release for if you get trapped in the trunk. And yeah, not much else to see back there. That's a little fuel chime because I've put a ton of miles on this thing this week. Uh, I've just had a blast driving it and I haven't wanted to stop driving it. So I've used almost a full tank of fuel. Now that we're inside though, this is where it becomes clear which automaker is responsible for this vehicle. We've got BMW switch gear, a BMW infotainment system, a BMW steering wheel, does have a JBL sound system, which uh, I'm, I'm honestly kind of surprised that they use JBL branding. That is Toyota's uh, premium sound system uh, supplier. So you've got JBL branding, so that is in line with Toyota, but that's really about it. BMW gear shifter, BMW buttons. Uh, something funny I noticed. Here's your trunk release button, and that is the exact same button that was used on my dad's 2003 BMW Z4. So not only is this a BMW part, but it's a BMW part that is nearly 20 years old. That aside though, this is a pretty decent interior. Uh, it's not really interesting. The seats are definitely sports car seats. You've got these uh, aluminum, I think they're plastic, but aluminum inlays in the seats. Bolsters are nice. Leather is pretty sturdy. They're not perforated, which would certainly be nice. But other than that, the seats are pretty nice. You've got carbon fiber here, which unlike in a lot of vehicles, carbon fiber makes sense in a sports car. Uh, BMW's infotainment controls have gotten a lot better over the years. Uh, this is no longer a reason to avoid BMW. Um, I know when BMW's iDrive system came out 15 or 20 years ago, uh, it was pretty much a nightmare to use, but just about everyone's figured out infotainment by now. So this is a pretty decent infotainment system. It is touchscreen, but then you've got redundant controls down here. Gear shifter is kind of funky. So to put the car in park, you press P. To put the car in drive, you press this button and then pull back. To put it in neutral, you can just press forward, but then to put the car in reverse, you've again got to press this button. So you can pop it into manual mode if you want. Something kind of funny, turn the car off while the car's in manual mode, watch what happens. The shifter pops back over into its default position. Here's your sport button. This is how you can configure different things here. So you've got individual sport and then basically normal modes. So let's configure. So here are all the different things that you can configure. You've got damping, steering, engine, and transmission. Uh, right now they are all set to sport mode. Um, one thing that you can't adjust is the exhaust and it does make a notable change when you go between normal and sport modes. Here we're in sport mode. I'll take it out of sport mode. I don't know if you could hear that, but the exhaust note got notably quieter. Back into sport. Yeah, it's louder in sport mode. So that's one thing that you can't change. Uh, I do think in some cases I would like to make the exhaust a little bit quieter, but when you want it to sound good, it sounds really good. And that brings us to the next part of this video where I want to demonstrate the four main ways to get really, really good sounds out of the Supra. All right, so I've got the camera in the back window uh, because I want you to be able to hear the car and also see me driving. It's gonna be a little awkward to try to talk, but I think it'll work. So four ways to make really good sounds come out of the new Supra. Uh, way one is to just turn the car on. Okay, so the car was in sport mode when I started it up there. Uh, it's really, really nice rush of noise out of the exhaust when you turn this thing on. So let's uh, get out on a main road and I can show you the other three ways. And I will have the car in sport mode for all of this because, well, it sounds way better in sport mode. So most of this I'm gonna do between second and third gears.
Okay, I just put the windows down. So the second way is to just upshift under hard acceleration. So we're gonna go in second gear and then. So there you go, when you upshift under hard acceleration, it really makes a uh, nice, like, quick, snappy noise. Third way is to downshift from third to second. So we're in third. Downshift. Third gear, back down to second. <laughs> Third now, and then I'm gonna let off the gas, downshift. Sounds pretty cool. And then the fourth way is to just lift your foot off the throttle. First, second, I'll lift it off of second. There's second gear. We're in third. I'm gonna lift and then downshift. Whoa, that was a good one. And there you go. There are four ways to get some really good sounds out of the Supra. So that's quietly, well, no pun intended, that's quietly one of my favorite things about this vehicle. Uh, you can have a lot of fun with it at low speeds, just playing with the RPMs and playing with the paddle shifters. Sometimes in cold weather or after the vehicle has sat for a little while, you'll even get some real, real notable crackles and pops that almost sound like gunshots. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. In the right setting, that's a good thing. Okay, so now we're in third, we're gonna give it a little gas, lift, downshift a second. That one sounded really good. So before we get into our final thoughts here, let's take a quick look at the window sticker. So you can see Toyota does brand this as the GR Supra, and this is a three liter premium model. It's built alongside the Z4 in Graz, Austria. Fuel economy is okay, 24 city, 31 highway, 26 combined. This car makes a lot of power, so if you're really getting 26 combined out of this, uh, then you're pretty much a magician. I've gotten far, far less than that over my week behind the wheel. As equipped, and there aren't really many options on these, if it were me, I would get one fully loaded and I'd only get one fully loaded because the options are things like active safety and uh, stuff stuff you want. And that brings the total price to $56,220. So not a lot to see on the window sticker for this thing. You're pretty much getting what you're getting with a Supra. The only options are this driver assist package. And then obviously for 2021, you can opt for a turbocharged four cylinder model. All right, so to wrap things up with the Supra here, main competitors for this vehicle, uh, the one that stands out the most to me is probably the Ford Mustang GT. Uh, they make similar power, similar performance. You can get them priced about the same. This is certainly a little more special, a little more exclusive, but I can see a lot of people cross shopping this vehicle with the Mustang GT. On the other end of the spectrum, you've got the Porsche Cayman. Uh, both vehicles have a fixed roof. Both vehicles prioritize performance. Both vehicles are pretty sporty, so I can definitely see these two being cross-shopped as well. And then, in a way, the BMW Z4, I think most buyers decide early on in their research process whether or not they want a convertible or a fixed roof. And uh, these two vehicles, the Supra and the Z4, behave similarly. They're built on the same platform. They use the same engine, slightly different tuning, maybe. Um, but they're said to perform pretty similarly. And uh, for the purposes of most buyers, I think they're pretty similar um, in terms of performance. That said, if you want a convertible, you got to go Z4. If you don't want a convertible, you're going to go Supra. So those are the three main ones. And then uh, I kind of think that if you're going to spend $50,000 on a performance car and you're interested in the Supra, you might as well consider pre-owned Mark IV Supras as well um, because they're worth about as much as this vehicle sells for new. Certainly your ownership experience is going to be a little bit different. Maintenance will be different. Um, wear and tear, you're going to have wear and tear on a used Supra. Um, but certainly you're going to have something that's even more exclusive than this vehicle if you were to buy a pre-owned Supra from the 1990s. So 
to me, those are the three main competitors to this vehicle. Um, on another note, after spending a week with this vehicle, I'm really having a hard time thinking of it as a Toyota product. Um, at first, we found out that Toyota was developing this vehicle alongside BMW. Then I remember some photos came out that showed that it was using BMW hubs and BMW infotainment. And then the actual car came out and we're able to now sit down behind the wheel and see that this is pretty much all BMW in here. Um, the only Toyota part on this vehicle that you can touch and feel and know that it's Toyota is the Toyota emblem. Um, everything else, BMW. It's built in Austria alongside the Z4 using all BMW parts. This is, this is a strange case. As a journalist, I want to present facts and come to understand things as they are truthfully. And the fact of the matter is, to me, this vehicle is a BMW product. And that certainly isn't meant to disparage it as a vehicle because it's a phenomenal car. I've had a ton of fun driving it. I really like it. I like the way it looks. It's fun to drive. It's relatively comfortable for a sports car. I think it's a very well executed vehicle. Um, I know some reviewers have said that it needs a little help with regard to suspension and it sounds like the 2021 model um, did get a retuned suspension that rectifies most of those issues. So it's a phenomenal car, but it's not a Toyota to me. Um, and you know, there's really nothing wrong with that. That said, my only issue is, and what I was really looking forward to with a revived Supra is, I've got right there a 21-year-old Toyota Land Cruiser that has 245,000 miles on the odometer and is still going strong. With a Toyota product, you know you're getting incredible quality, great reliability, great resale value, and um, with a new Supra, I was really looking forward to having something akin to a Toyota Land Cruiser, but in sports car form. Um, that doesn't exist with this vehicle because underneath it all, it's a German luxury car, and you know, German luxury cars tend to not experience the same reliability as Toyota products. So I think that's a little disappointing. I have to wonder if there weren't opportunities for Toyota to work with Lexus on this vehicle. I think it's kind of funny that um, Toyota went to another luxury automaker when they had Lexus in the same offices. Um, companies basically operate as one and the same, so it's really kind of strange when Lexus has a rear-wheel drive sports car platform. Um, they've got performance-oriented engines. It's kind of strange to me that Toyota went to BMW when they had Lexus all along, but um, you know, the final product does work. There's no questioning that. It's fun. It's exciting that a Supra is back, and um, you know, my thoughts and feelings toward this vehicle basically being a BMW product are in no way meant to diminish its credibility as a really fun sports car. But I think I should probably wrap things up. Um, yeah, Supra, kind of a weird situation. I can't really think of another instance where one company has built a very unique vehicle for another company because this thing has all unique body work and a unique interior and everything. But either way, 2020 Supra. I'm glad it's back. It's a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, this one's going to be tough to give back to Toyota because I really liked it. Thanks for watching.